welcome to the Queer Manga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education, and outreach. And on behalf of our board of directors, our advisors, and our supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Queer Among the Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness, following the footsteps of our founder, Dr. Felicitas Goodman, anthropologist. And as an educational institution, we recognize to thrive, we must take an open approach. So we're inviting scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've included a full spectrum of topics, including neuroscience, uh, mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, shamanism, on and on and on, mythology. Uh, and you're welcome to visit our website at queermungainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And of course, we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queer Among Gay Institute. Today, let's, let's take on this big question. What's this fascination we have with superheroes? I mean, Hollywood is obsessed with making these superhero films. Since the year 2000, they've made over a hundred big budget movies featuring these superhero characters. This fascination with superhuman abilities is universal. It seems that people through the ages and across the globe have wished to break free of the limits of our own human existence. And maybe we look to superheroes as beacons of selflessness in an age too often that we see corruption and negativity. And let's face it, we all want those powers and abilities of these superheroes, common powers like telekinesis, telepathy, teleportation, uh, super strength, invisibility, weather manipulation, uh, astounding speeds, immortality, X-ray vision, elasticity, telepathy, and powers to generate, and of course, the ability to fly. Well, those are um, those are mystical powers of the shamans and the religious specialists of old. Those are all accessible in various uh, trance states. But um, what do we want to do today? Uh, first of all, I have to thank a couple people. I have to thank Fred Smith, Vedic scholar. We're at his home in Santa Fe, uh, broadcasting from his his home with high-speed internet. Thank you, Fred, and he'll be uh, commenting here today as Vedic scholar, appreciate that. I also wanna thank Rain, a librarian that we met when we were checking out films from the MCU, uh, the Marvel Comic Universe, because we had a few films to fill in. We went to the local Pueblo <laughs> Library, the Pewaukee Pueblo Library, yeah. and this young man's behind the counter looking at us like, what do you guys want? And uh, so Laura Yeah, I have a few in. films I need to fill in, you know, so watch some of them, but not all, all of them. All of a sudden, this young man goes into stories. So oh, he says, you know, my, my father was a mythologist, and I read comic books as a young man, and he was all up on it, and he loaned me his personal copy yeah, the library of the didn't book have of our guest today, <laughs> All the Marvels. From, uh, by Douglas Walk, our guest today. Yeah. So this is uh, this is exciting. <laughs> well, here we are today. I want to just put this into context that we have been examining our worldview from various angles here in this forum, especially our view of ourselves in the greater sphere of our world, our era as contrasted with previous eras, our role and our relationship to the cosmos at large. And what's enduring and popular in our culture, it's like holding up a mirror. What has translated from the past that we find in the present? One of those are the mythic heroes of old. They've taken on new guises. They've taken on new, new powers. And we enjoy them in both comic books and their popularity and the films derived from them. Their traits, their flaws, their missions, their origin stories. What do they have in common? Uh, what are they tasked with? Maintaining order in the universe. That is a very ancient uh, job. They live on in our culture in new ways, in new mediums. They have a long lineage. You know, when we were sitting around the campfire, looking at the starry night sky and telling stories, when the thousand line stanzas of old were acted out, the stories that everyone knew, when the constellations represented those mythic heroes, when we saw on the walls of Egyptian temples, they had graphic novels, 
right? They had scene, action, scene, action, sequential scene. Uh, they had the first comic books writ on those walls. Mm -hmm. The graphic novels today, the films of the day, just carrying on what comic books have been doing for a very long time. And today's guest, Douglas Wolk, uh, author of all of the Marvels, he and his son have read 27,000 Marvel comic books. That's half a million pages. One of the largest continual single narratives to date, uh, creating a mostly coherent universe yeah. with thousands of contributors. I know Harry Potter did that, create a universe, Star Wars, Star Trek, but Marvel comic books, uh, the comic books were added early, early on. There's a rule set to this. These hero and heroines appear in each other's stories. Uh, this is quite an undertaking. Thank you for joining us from Portland, Oregon, your home. And thank you for all the work that you've done, Douglas, to make this more accessible, to kind of explain it to us for joining, to us, joining us today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I should say that I read all 27,000 of uh, Marvel superhero comics from like 1961 up to 2017 or so, except I actually kept reading beyond that. My son was with me at the beginning of that and kind of gave me that. He didn't read it. He didn't read it all. He he, gotcha. he sticks yeah. to the stuff he likes. Yeah. He does it the smart As way. As is prerogative. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. He, like, that's the right way to do it. I'm doing it the wrong way. <laughs> and you say that in your, your book, um, yeah. which I read parts of. Um, you say that really there's so, so much of it. You would drive yourself crazy trying to put it into a co coherent linear so you just go with what what interests you but tell us how you got into this what what where did your journey begin with this oh so my journey with comics goes way way back to like little nine-year-old douglas on like summer vacation visiting my grandparents uh you know i went to a newsstand i picked up an issue of Green Lantern, Green Arrow, I think. And then I wanted to find out what happened next. And so I went back next month and the next issue continued the story. And oh, uh, this character is actually in another comic. Uh, oh, I should pick that up too. Oh, this one looks kind of interesting too. Oh, there's a store down the street that sells nothing but comics and they get them once a week. Every Friday, there's new ones. I know what I'm doing every Friday now. And by two year, a couple of years later, they're like, okay, Douglas, we're just going to teach you to use the register. Uh, so I, I worked there for uh, yes. a lot of my yeah, high You had to years. earn your way to ownership. Um, yeah. Went to college, got out of college, uh, fell backwards by accident into music journalism, was editing a music magazine for a while, and we had some pages we needed to fill. And the editor in chief was like, well, you know, we should review some other media. Do you want to, like, I was like, I can write about comics because that'll, they don't have to pay me for that and I'll fill a few pages. And that kind of turned into a sideline of writing about comics, which eventually became my entire job. And at some point, and I talk about this a bit in the book, um, my son, who was then about 10 uh, and had never been interested in superhero comics, he always liked comics, but superhero comics, like that's what my dad likes, guilty as charged. Uh, but right. uh, he realized, oh, oh, this is a complicated system. Oh, I like complicated systems. Hey, Dad, let's read all the Marvel superhero comics together. Well, okay, you're 10. You're going to be interested in this for a week tops. It'll be a nice week. And so we started reading, and he got really into it, and he just kind of kept going. And I thought, oh, you know, I've been looking for a big project. What would actually happen if I read all of these comics. How would I do that? What what would that gigantic story look like as a story? Because it's it's a huge story. I mean, it's yes. been going for 60 years plus. There are hundreds of thousands of artists and writers who have worked on it. It is so big that not even anybody who is making the story has read the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So of course I had to read it all and I figured, okay, so it'll take me like Mm, a year and a, maybe a year and a half to read all the comics and then another eight or nine months to write the book and seven years later here we are right with with more with more i have to tell you my comic <laughs> book story so um and this was what got me interested in the whole genre not that i mm -hmm. read comic books but i was um I was ill one time and I had a boyfriend previous to you that was into the Vedas. Mm -hmm. 
And he handed me, he said, here, while you recuperate, here's a stack of comic books. They were all about the various uh, gods of India. And so I thought, okay, let me read about Hanuman. And then I read about Lakshmi. And then I read about Indra. Then I read Vishnu's story, then Saraswati's story. And they all related. They were all characters in each other's story. And I thought, this is fascinating. This is a coherent mythology. This is a universe unto itself. This, it was a good dive into that world. Yeah. It was fascinating how they were all in the, uh, one big narrative. And I thought, oh, I have new respect for India because it's coherent, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because right. it has a rhyme and a reason to it. And I, th- I knew nothing about it, right? And I thought, this is, this is very cool. So I think it's interesting that we've recreated such a universe today, or we've taken some of those old heroes. I mean, Thor features so nicely in all of the superheroes. And you take somebody with a very ancient lineage and you uh, interact with all the modern superheroes. I thought, oh, this is, this is cool. You have Dr. Strange, who really represents the shamans, right? And the mystics and mm-hmm. brings in that, that lineage. Thought, okay, this is fun. This, this was fun homework to do. Yeah. So um, is there some kind of registry of the rule set of the universe? Is there, or is it just loose? Is there some, <clears throat> you know, governing body so that somebody can't come in and start making bizarro rules? Or do they all just integrate into each other? You've got time travel, you've got, you know, you've got all of this, multiple universes, which I can argue, okay, physics today, theoretical physicists are arguing that very same thing. Mm -hmm. And so are we in a fictional way, as art is want to do, is task to do, are we playing with the concepts that the leading edge of science is delivering home to us to play with. So you, you ask if, if there is if concrete rule set, and there kind of is and there kind of isn't. Um, there is this body of comics, and these comics like were not created from the beginning to be a coherent mythological system. They were created by a very small number of people initially who were working on very, very tight deadlines to make very, very cheap children's entertainment. And then at some point, it just kind of all came together because there's this body of work and you build on the earlier body of work and you build on that and you build on that. And eventually like you add enough stones, you have a cairn, you add enough stones, you have a castle. Uh, And that's how it came together bit by bit and stone by stone and pretty much totally accidentally. You you started having, you know, the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man in the same world because Spider-Man is getting his own comic and for the first issue we need something to goose sales so we'll put the Fantastic Four on the cover. And then it becomes a world that they both live in and things that happen to one of them are going to affect what happens to the other one. And it just organically grows. it It comes as an organic accident out of the most crass commercial intentions. (laughs) <laughs> well, I appreciate that it's commerce, it's art, yeah. it's mythology, it's entertainment, it's publishing. Yeah. It's just this culmination. By the way, we interviewed Stan Lee yeah. back in the wow. late We're... 90s mm-hmm. um, when he was, yeah. So among our 10,000. 000... <laughs> he wasn't that young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what a character. Um, yeah. so, so it just kind of organically grew. But there seems to be like a rule set because you read them, these writers have read it, and they're building on that. Yeah. Um, I will tell you my, my favorite story about a rule set. Um, so the early Doctor Strange comics, Steve Ditko is plotting them and drawing them. Stanley is writing the dialogue. And he's just making up stuff off the top of his head. Right. There's a woman named Cat Ironwood who uh, has also lived in, in the Southwest for ages and ages. And at one point in the 70s, she was on unemployment on welfare and figured that this was the government paying her to do whatever she felt like doing. Uh, you know, Cat Ironwood, great. Um, uh, for success. So she went through all the early Doctor Strange comics and tried to write down all the spells for them and compile them into a coherent system of magic. Interesting. And called it the lesser book of the Vishanti and sent it to Marvel Comics where it apparently became a reference book for subsequent people writing Dr. Strange stories. Gotcha. Uh, completely by accident. 
it came together, but it did come together and it became this kind of coherent system. Uh, in the 80s, Marvel was publishing you know, official handbooks, which are like, okay, we're going to like put down canonically, how tall are these characters? How much can they bench press? Uh, what do they look like? What is their backstory? Uh, what are, let's, let's see diagrams of all these devices that and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but so that stuff got recorded. Uh, people have tried to come up with coherent theories of time travel within this fictional setting or how multiple universes work within this fictional setting. And of course it always takes about two weeks until somebody writes something that breaks it, but you know, um, there's uh, it's an evolving but, universe, right? Yeah. So there you but, go. Uh, then people will try to figure out a way to make it work again, to integrate it, to put it together. There's a thing that Marvel did in the sixties when people would write in like, Ooh, I think I see a logical inconsistency. Of course you see a logical inconsistency. There's lots of those. Uh, but they said like, okay, if you can not only point out the logical inconsistency, but come up with a reason why it's not actually inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Something that, that like makes this apparent error actually make sense. We will send you, well, we can't send you a prize exactly. Cause there's legal stuff around that. We'll send you a no prize. An empty no, envelope. <laughs> and, uh, it was, in fact, an envelope that said enclosed is your like fully automated, highly charged Marvel no prize. Congratulations. And the envelope was empty. Um, but there's a very, very fancily decorated envelope. But I would think that that would be celebrated, right? Because these are these are people very, very interested. And maybe they're pointing out the genesis for a new story. Yeah. Right? Um, maybe I'm, they're. Absolutely. There is yeah. there is a. I think they're doing you a favor. Yeah, they're totally doing you a favor. Uh, yeah. There is a group now that called the Marvel Chronology Project, whose business is to figure out exactly what order all of these stories happened in. Now, that's a little bit of uh, that. That can be difficult because chronology okay. created s simultaneously by a bunch of different people who are working separately from each other and sometimes you're gonna run into a problem and so there are these very thoughtful lengthy very polite talmudic discussions of like how can we square these inconsistent chronologies when my son and i were starting to read through these comics we got to a point fairly early on where you know, basically a has to happen before b b has to happen before c c has to happen before a what are we going to do about that well, I said, let's look online and see what sort of explanations people have come up with. And so we looked around at various explanations that people had offered for this, like, contradiction between two stories published 55 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, there's a bunch of different explanations. But, hey, kiddo, what's the one you like? He was like, well, there's somebody who explains that uh, Daredevil actually wears his new costume for the first time before he thinks he's wearing his new costume for the first time and he doesn't recognize it because he's blind. Great, okay, we'll go with that. That's how it's gonna work in our heads. Was your son satisfied since he likes complicated system? That probably works. Was he satisfied with it? Um, it's satisfied enough to keep going. It's like, okay, that's, that's what we're gonna, we're just gonna take that as given and we're gonna, we're gonna keep going. Yep. Um, the heroes of old and the modern day heroes, I like to compare those mm -hmm. because they have all have an origin story. So heroes of old, for the most part, have a human mother and a god as a father, gives them the superpowers. But you have heroes today where a radioactive spider bit them or technology affords them their superpowers or um, some other accident of the universe. It could mm -hmm. be an every man that suddenly is bequeathed with the role of a superhero. And now not only do you have to use and wield them, learn to wield the powers, but you have to come up within yourself, the character attributes to be responsible enough, to be wise enough, to be heroic enough to wield them, right? You don't wanna be a failed hero. And I think it's interesting that one of those traits again and again is that ability we all have, we all need to muster within ourselves is in the eyes of defeat, when you have a setback, you need to get up again and keep fighting, right? That's really the true, uh, one of the true 
key elements of a hero. You don't give up. That's reflected. You don't give up. And I think that's one of the ways that the heroes serve us is as a reminder, find it within yourself to keep going. Find find that character. Be step up and be a hero. You are my superhero in life. Um, keep going. I mean, it's a call to action. It's a call to be your best. And um, how do you define a hero? Huh. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I tend to like complicated heroes. I like protagonists where you're not always sure if you should be sympathizing with them or not. Uh, I like stories that get into really tricky ethical territory and where it keeps shifting under your feet. That is a much more recent way of looking at, especially superhero stories than, you know, the 1930s, 1940s kind of paradigm. Uh, but the idea that, okay, so you have these very, very powerful entities and they're acting in the interest of what they think is, they think is right, what they think is an appropriate end goal. And maybe not everybody agrees with them. And maybe they're sort of right and maybe they're sort of not. And we start to see that a lot more in the 1990s. We're seeing it a lot now because that is the world that we're living we in live where in. there's, there's yeah. massive massive gray areas and one thing that superhero stories are really really good at is telling stories about our world but made much more vivid and weird and interesting and lively yeah. and larger than life uh so and the, the x-men comics of the last couple of years it's really interesting to see that like a lot of old school readers have been saying like but they're not superheroes anymore. They're, uh, you know, they're doing like really, really unethical things. Like, uh huh. But when were they not really? You know, mm -hmm. um, this is like they have become a series about a put upon, discriminated among class that has founded its own nation and become an international superpower and is acting on the world stage in ways that benefit it and don't necessarily bet benefit anything else. Quite and an accurate like, reflection of today, isn't it? And and there, and so there are certain readers who are like, but I want stories about superheroes beating up supervillains. Like you got those. Yeah. There's lots yeah. there's lots of those on your shelf. Yeah. yeah. You can go back, but nobody's taking them away. They're, they're, they're still there. <laughs> um, but there are also characters who are meant to be like actual like ethical paragons or more or less ethical paragons because one really interesting thing about the early marvel comics is that from the beginning there was something a little iffy about a lot of their characters you know tony stark iron man is literally an arms manufacturer mm -hmm. incredibly arrogant tends to like build war devices as his response to everything <laughs> uh and you know he's our protagonist but maybe we don't always feel good about him peter parker when we see him before he's spider-man he is a jerk of a kid he is bitter and angry and nerdy and does very poorly socialized and on his path to become you know dr octopus is basically what spider-man could have been if he made a different set of choices and things didn't go so well for him there's an amazing story from about 15 years ago that's you know kind of an, it is alternate world spider-man story where you know his uncle never died he never had the personal tragedy um his girlfriend never died all the bad things that happened to him never happened to him he just got his powers and he became a beloved superhero and a beloved pro wrestling star and a beloved actor and he's a terrible person he is just an unmitigated jerk i love that that's fascinating <laughs> because the heroes have to have flaws they are on their own hero journey 
they have to grow just like we do, right? They have challenges. And, and it's the story how of they... humanity, that yin yang of, of, of balance, much like the Pueblo tradition has the sacred clowns who, during yeah. these very formal ceremonies, is the clowns moving around the outside. Tricksters mixing it Tricksters, up. yeah, breaking up the and keeping the things yeah. in balance. Well, yeah. we all have our Achilles heel, right? Mm -hmm. We all have those, those. What I found interesting also is that the heroes of old, when we talk about them today, we give them our own modern values. So Thor, Thor at the end hangs it up. I've been this, doing this for a thousand years, been the perfect golden boy. Now I want to go find myself here. Take over the Valkyrie, take over the kingship. I'm going off to on my walkabout. I love that. I love that because that's what each of us are doing. Are we so not you, living so multiple you, lifetimes in the space of one? Multiple a really roles. interesting thing that I was mentioning within, within the Marvel story is that within, within this fictional story, within this fictional universe, every body of human mythology every body of human mythology is just something that happened at some point that somebody wrote down yeah so you know thor and the norse pantheon are real thor hangs out with hercules who's a greek god and yeah. the greek pantheon is also a thing uh, and the shinto pantheon and the native american pantheons and like they're all real within this world um and what about when they have conflicting creation myths? Eh, you know, it happened a long time ago. You can say it happened your way. I'll say it Different happened your way. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, Different sectors of this multi-universe. But I think that in and of itself is a precursor to what the world is doing today. To be one family, we have to interact with all the various cultures. Remain intact as a culture, but you're interacting with everyone else as one melting pot, right? And it's just what we need today. That's a, that's a paving, paving the path we need to go, honoring it all. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the there is the question of what are stories that people actually just make up within this story? Is there even space for that? Um, there, there's a, a long running gag that within the Marvel Universe, there are Marvel comics. Marvel comics exist. They are famous for their meticulously accurate depictions of historical events. Uh, but, you know, uh, so if you, if you read a Spider-Man comic within the Marvel Universe, you are reading meticulously accurate documentation of how things actually happened. Uh, and uh, the comics code, which no longer exists in our world, the comics code in the fictional world is in fact a government agency, and if something has the comics code seal on it, uh, that is that means that it has been so thoroughly vetted by this government agency that it can be <laughs> ad admitted as evidence in court. It's it's nice that it builds in its own legitimacy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, it's trope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's talk about the art because that is so yeah. much a piece of this. And I understand that there is a book for artists of how to draw for the Marvel universe and that there are conventions within the art about how to depict things. So for example, there is a Marvel way uh, to show somebody's feet coming at you. They're jumping at you. How do you depict that in terms of perspective was the example given. I have not seen this book. I've just So, so the book is called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. Okay. Uh, it was put together by jo John Buscema and Stan Lee in the mid seventies. And it was basically just like responding to a need in the market for like kids who wanted to know how to draw comics. And the answer to that was almost always like, make it look more like Jack Kirby would have drawn it. Kirby is the less, the lesser known of the, the three great parents of the Marvel characters. It's Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. Um, Kirby was the idea guy. Kirby was the artist. Uh, he drew Fantastic Four. He drew Thor. He drew the early Avengers stuff. He drew early X-Men. He developed Thor. He developed Iron Man. He developed the Hulk. He, uh, Sergeant Fury, who I saw mentioned in the chat, was one of his. Uh, the way that Lee and Kirby collaborated is not necessarily the way people think about making comics, because Comics are narrative, and people think of comics and narrative in terms of like writing. Somebody 
writes it, and that is the creation of it. And then maybe somebody makes some pictures. That's not how it worked. Lee and Kirby worked uh, what Lee called Marvel style, which is that either Kirby would come up with a plot entirely by himself, which very often happened for the later years of their collaboration, or like, he would have a plot conference with Lee about it, or like Lee occasionally would write like a little one paragraph synopsis of what was going to happen in a given issue, usually not with Kirby. Kirby, they would just talk or Kirby, Kirby would just do it himself. And then Kirby would go and draw the entire comic, stage the whole thing, figure out what the characters were, what they looked like, what they were doing, draw the whole thing, and then send it to Lee, who would then write the dialogue and the captions. Interesting. But the story, the plot, was Kirby's. So both Lee and Kirby, there, there's a fascinating book called Lee and Kirby's Stuff Said that came out a few years ago, which is just collections of every interview that the editor could find with either of them talking about how their collaboration worked. And anytime the word writing appears in there, it is in red. It's printed in red because what Lee and different Kirby definition think, of writing. Yeah. They what they thought writing was was so different mm -hmm. that it was two different things. As far as Kirby was concerned, I am the person who comes up with the characters, I come up with the plot, I come up with what happens where. I'm the writer, that's writing. As far as Lee was concerned, like, no, I pick all the words that are on the page. I write all the dialogue, I write all the captions, that's writing. I am the writer. Mm -hmm. And so they both correctly believed, according to their own definition, that they were the writer. Mm -hmm. uh, because we think in terms of words, we tend to think of Lee as not just the person who came up with the dialogue and captions, but the person who came up with the story, and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, the story happened collaboratively. Likewise, with his other great collaborator, Steve Ditko, who was the uh, Doctor Strange guy and the Spider-Man guy early on. So in the 70s, how to draw comics the Marvel way is just basically how do you do cartooning in a way that's really dynamic and really in your face, really foreshortened the kind like yeah. the way that Kirby would do it. Like his punch would not be a punch like that. It would be coming right at you. Um, so that was the house style at the company in the seventies, everything pretty much kind of looked like that, except for some stuff by like young, interesting, rebellious artists who were kind of do off doing their own thing. And it no longer is that. Right. If you look at, even when Kirby and then Ditko returned to Marvel in the late seventies and early eighties, they looked their stuff looked very old fashioned. And you can look at a comic from any time in the last 60 years. And guess and, it's vintage. And yeah. guess it's vintage. Like you can tell like what, when it was drawn plus or minus two years, three years. Wow. Evolving, yeah. which is Evolving. exciting. Yeah. You know, um, you quote George R. Martin, no, otherwise known as George R. R. Martin, author of the Game of Thrones, all that, as saying, being a, a comic book aficionado and saying, how do you guys pack so much in such little space? And um, that, that was an interesting point of trivia. And also those three that you talk about really are heroes within their world. Because when talking with Rain, the librarian, he was saying, you know, I like Marvel because these guys created more interesting heroes. They had a more interesting journey that I could relate to than the per perfect heroes of some of the other, like DC and others. These guys were more interesting. I could relate to them better. And you were right. alluding to that in terms of their flaws and their humanness and and all of that, really a reflection of our ourselves and our aspirations, our goals are. Yeah. Do you wanna um, comment on that a little further? Yeah, um, and I should add that like the George R. R. Martin quote, that was the first thing he ever published. He was like 12 years old, 13 years old, something like that, and had a fan letter published in Fantastic Four. Uh, one fantastically interesting thing, if you look at 60s Marvel in particular and 70s Marvel, is that the people writing into the letter columns, like, they're names that you recognize from later on. They are the people who went on to write and draw these comics and to be the editors of comics companies and also like TV writers and like film, film creators and like mm -hmm. 
a lot of names that you recognize from much early later. education and turning. early passion yeah. that help fuel and, their later careers. Yeah. Right. And, you know, Stanley's line in the bullpen bulletins pages and 60s Marvel were always like, oh, yeah, if you if you uh, write into us, you can become part of this grand cultural project we're doing, which like that's obviously a lie, right? That is a lie that you tell 11 year old boys to get them to spend their 12 cents on a comic book. And it also turned out to be true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, that's amazing. I just um, would call it welcoming your community, you yeah, know, bringing um, up the it, ranks. Right. It, it, yeah. Um, and it was a you know performative kind of like flim flam showmany kind of thing to do and it was also true it was real um and i love that in terms of like reflecting our world yeah i mean the comics reflect our world at every stage because that's what the people that's the world that the people who were making them were living in and they did stories about the stuff that they were interested in. One of the most interesting things I discovered when I was researching this book was like, you could look at the first uh, Hulk story as like, okay, so, you know, there's a uh, atomic bomb test and he's caught in that. Like, okay, fine. It's about like cold war atomic bomb fear. And then I looked at the timing of it and there was an international nuclear testing moratorium that was in effect for a good long while that was lifted barely before Kirby and Lee would have started working on the first Hulk story. So mm. it's not just about like, we are fearing atomic power. It is about like, whoa, these bombs have just become a significant thing in our world again, right now, this is ripped from our headlines. Yeah. If you look at you know, the last 60 years of Captain America stories, it is always always a story about how america views itself yes uh, or and how it would like to view itself or how it has been forced to view itself there's a moment in uh, the mid 70s where i talk about this a little bit in the book uh, there's this amazing amazing sequence where like the head of the secret empire like you know this villainous conspiracy um is unmasked in the Oval Office, and it's very obviously Richard Nixon, uh, who then like kills himself in the Oval Office. And this is a scene that was published three months before Nixon resigned. Wow. Well, that's the job of artists <laughs> to put finger to the wind and use fiction to tell ourselves something true about ourselves. What is it? Yeah. The Fiction is the lies that we tell in order to tell the truth, right? That famous yeah. quote from Ursula, somebody, <laughs> right? Um, and and so it is. I mean, we we do that. We do that because we need to emote that. We need to figure it out. We need to play with it. We need to start exploring. It's imagined before it's made reality in life, isn't it? Yeah, it's such a good canvas to work it all out on, I think. And this is just one of many, the comic books. Yeah. The fact is, is that in indigenous cultures, the storytelling is primary to their entire culture and how they exist and right. how they pass on the stories of themselves and, and the storytelling, whether it's the Aboriginal story, such an Americans interesting or whether medium. it's yeah. you know, going back all through human history. So the significance of taking this, this and, and maybe that's where Marvel uh, finds its role, and that is it's showing the flaws it's showing the true nature of ourselves that we're not we're not putting superheroes on a pedestal that they're they're somehow um, have perfection that they're just regular guys that have these abilities and maybe that's an inspiration to us that's like you know that maybe this a part of ourselves that wants to adapt superhero abilities and talents even though we have our flaws in our dreams and our trance states what do we do we fly we have these superpowers right we right. see this in our culture because it reflects our spirit journeys right right, right. these abilities and right. these adventures mm. there's order in the universe I, I find it interesting the various ways that uh evil is depicted in these stories as a function of the cosmos an element of the cosmos um, how capricious the Greek gods were, right? They had these abilities, but they were pretty bad boys, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Creating chaos and um, really not, I mean, it, it's just interesting, the abuse of power that yeah. I, I thought Thanos was interesting in the Avenger later ones, because 
it is a situation that we are faced with today. There's too many people. There's too many living things in the universe. What is just? Are you going to cut out half of them randomly so the rest can thrive? I mean, that is something that we are facing. We need to control population. So we don't have enough resources to go. We better use resources more. How do we justly go about solving some of the world's ills today? So the, the one like... interesting. It was an interesting yeah. way to create a bad guy. Yeah. The one kind of wait a minute here uh, thing that I have with the entire like Marvel Cinematic Universe is the version of Thanos in the movies. Um, he, he wants to have enough resources for everybody, so he doesn't use his Infinity Gauntlet to double the amount of resources, which he could just as well, right? Uh, the, the biggest change to him from the comics is that the version in the comics does what he does because he literally is in love with death the personification of death. You know, that is a reason he wants to like give his love death a giant present. And so that's 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 an interesting thing. But yes, uh, as Paul mentioned, I do have a kind of slideshow lecture thing that's probably about half an hour, um, but we got yes. some time, so. Let's do it. Uh, are you up for that? Right. Sounds good. I, did, I will ask you just a personal yeah. question. Yeah. I don't know if your parents are still alive, but what did your parents think when they saw you becoming the oh, expert, uh, the expert of comic <laughs> books? Like my son, I thought you were going to become a doctor. You know what? <laughs> you know what? They have been unfailingly supportive to me all the way. Oh, perfect. Um, you know, and they see my book get reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review, they're going to cavil a little, right? <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Uh, you redeemed yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're you know, like, it's not their thing, but they're fine with it. Uh, yeah. And, they, you know, they, I'm so grateful to them. Like, from the beginning, they're like, do your thing. Do your thing. Perfect. Um, Good parents. Good parenting. Good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. so I'm going to share my screen. Somebody pointed out that there is a melody that everybody sings when they say, I'm going to share my screen. Um, that's it. So this is this is the book. Uh, is it coming up on everybody's screen OK? Yes, we see it. Fabulous. OK, so um, <clears throat> in the course of this story that's been going on for a bit over 60 years, there are certain objects that appear in some form over and over and they tell us something about what kind of story it is uh so these are these are the five that i'm pointing out this is a talk called a history of the marvel universe in five objects um the first of these objects is the time platform here this is an actual working time machine uh it was invented in college by one victor von doom also known as dr doom uh, I do a podcast about him called The Voice of Latveria. Um, it is on pause right now, but it's coming back in a couple months. Um, Dr. Doom. Uh, so the characteristics of the time platform are that it is not just a time machine. It is a space and time machine, because if you're traveling in time, you're traveling in space too. Uh, it has a thing called a chronoton protection field. So basically, like, it, it's an anti-butterfly effect a thing built into it, uh, although that hasn't always been used by people who don't know how to use it. And it gives off uh, stuff called Von Doom radiation, which is uh, you know, very dirty, very noisy. Uh, the first chronological appearance of uh, the Dr. Doom's Titan platform on Earth was around 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period, uh, which is identified as 900 million years ago. Let's just say that 900 million years ago was when the Marvel Universe's Cretaceous period was, as opposed to ours. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what, what you're seeing here is uh, you know, Godzilla being sent through it. Godzilla was in the Marvel Universe for a while. Um, also, uh, the Fantastic Four used it to go to the year 2940 BC, where they met uh, Pharaoh Ramatut, who was a time traveler whose time machine was the Sphinx for reasons. Um, many, many years later, there's an issue of Doctor Strange here, where Doctor Strange is traveling backwards in time through his astral form and ends up in the same time and same place as this comic that was published 20 years earlier. Uh, and uh, a few years after that, there's an issue of West Coast Avengers, where they're traveling backwards through time, and they also happen to end up uh, in the same time and the same place as these two comics that were published earlier. And actually, uh, Apocalypse, who's a longtime enemy, the X-Men, was in the Sphinx time machine at the same time, he was just hiding behind a wall. 
we'll run into him again. Um, so there's a question of, so we have this time traveler Ramatut and we have this time traveler Dr. Doom and they, here they are in 1964 saying like, but what if we're the same person? This question was eventually definitively answered. No, no, they're not. Uh, the time platform was also used by the thing to go to the year 130 BC so that his uh, friend Alicia Masters could meet Alexandrus of Antioch. But unfortunately, he got into a fight with Hercules, you know, Greek god, hanging out, uh, and accidentally broke the arms off of Venus de Milo. So that's how that happened. Um, the time platform was also used by Doom and Iron Man to uh, go to the Arthurian era. Here they are arriving at Camelot. Uh, it was taken to 1348 by the Avengers to, because uh, some reason they wanted to see the Black Death for themselves. Don't ask me. Uh, it was hijacked by Cotton Mather. Yes, that Cotton Mather to take the Scarlet Witch to 1692 for the Salem Witch Trials for Wanda Maximoff. And of course, it was used by Doom himself in his first appearance to send the Fantastic Four to the 18th century, uh, where uh, the thing became the historical Blackbeard. Uh, but the mission was to retrieve some jewels that may or may not have been Infinity Gems, just saying. Uh, it was also used in the year 2099 for Doom to meet his own future self, kinda. And it was used by The Thing and Captain America to go to the early 3000s to meet the original Guardians of the Galaxy, who are the ones from the 31st century who inspired the 20th or 21st century Guardians of the Galaxy because causality. That is the way causality works when you have time travel. So what does the time platform mean in the context of this story? It means that time is fluid for the purposes of the story. It is not unidirectional. I talk about... Uh, in the book about the way that Marvel has three or four different chronologies. There's the one in which the story was published, the one in which the events of the story happen, which is different and can be more different by character because time travel, but most importantly, the order in which you experience it. Because for the purposes of reading, you have a time machine. You don't need to read any part of the story in order. You can go wherever you want. You have a time machine, why not use it? So, the second of our objects here is the Darkhold, which is particularly mutable. It turned up a couple weeks ago when uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. The Darkhold is all over that movie. It is a book. It's a collection of spells that was written down by the Elder, go elder God Kthan, or Chthan, however you want to pronounce it. He is the god of chaos, and his magic makes things more chaotic, or chaotic, I guess. Um, and uh, it's called the Dark Hold because it was written in a cave inside this mountain known as the Dark Hold. Okay, fine. Uh, it's described here as <clears throat> the first book, which is overstating things. Uh, initially, it was just some scrolls. And in fact, decoratively leather bound books were not around until about the year 400 AD. Uh, but the Dark Hold can make vampires and werewolves and zombies and other things that the comics code used to prohibit from the 50s to the 70s or later in the case of zombies that's a whole lot of discussion but notably the dark holds pages are indestructible they can be separated but they can't be destroyed and so an early cult of mystics in atlantis tried to use it to take over the world but they also used to make vampires which killed them using dark hold never ends well wah wah uh, the Darkhold also turned up in England in the 16th century, or, sorry, the 6th century, where uh, Modred the Mystic here tried to use it. That didn't go well for him either. And Modred is not to be confused with Mordred the Mystic, whose contemporary Morgan Le Fay founded a new cult around it in Arthurian times, which did not go well for them either. Anyway, uh, it's kept turning up in unexpected places like a pre-Babylonian tomb that was unearthed in the 1920s, which is how Carnage got mixed up with it, long story. And uh, it was also in a trunk that was opened in the 1950s by Jimmy Wu, an agent of Atlas, later an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, you might have seen him in the Ant-Man movies or in WandaVision. Uh, then it fell into the hands of a guy named Gregory Russoff, who just by reading it, activated a curse and become, became a werewolf. Bad book, bannable book. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. Um, so he passed the lycanthropy curse on to his son, who turned into a world just by touching the thing. Uh, Darkhold pretty much corrupts anyone who touches it. So Doctor Strange, at least the version of the comics, figured out he had to read it from a distance because it's it's not totally evil. It has some useful stuff, like there's a spell in it called the Montesi formula, which could destroy all vampires, which he did. 
And the only one that it spared was a guy named Hannibal King, who had decided when he became a vampire that he would never bite a human, so he only robbed, robbed blood banks and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, Doctor Strange screwed it up because of some stuff involving his brother. So a few years later, vampires came back, and now the Montesi formula doesn't work anymore. Oh, well. Um, later on, this little very Twin Peaks looking guy uh, started turning up and offering people individual pages from the dark hold, which could get them out of whatever jams they were in at the cost of their soul. Yeah, very twin, twin Peaks. And of course, it keeps falling into the hands of poor, poor Wanda Maximoff here. Uh, now, what this says is from the dark hold comes monsters, but that's not quite true. What comes from it is transformations. And the Marvel story is full of people who have been transformed one way or another against their will or find themselves with powers they never asked for. Uh, it's not, as you were saying, the like divine parent and human parent. It is the, you have a human life and then at some point the change comes to you. And the question the Marvel story keeps asking is what are you gonna do about it? And sometimes you don't get a choice. That's what the Darkhold does. Now, the third of our five objects here is the shield of Imhotep, which you see here. This may be kind of familiar looking because it is the ancestor of a few other shields. Now, in our world, Imhotep was a chancellor to the Pharaoh Djoser in the 27th century BCE. In the Marvel world, he was a pharaoh himself, and it was <clears throat> at that time that the Earth was invaded by, <clears throat> excuse me, by the Brood, who are these aliens who turned up in old X-Men stories. So when the Earth was invaded by the Brood, Imhotep beat them back, and either he formed a group called the Brotherhood of the Shield, or he had that group name themselves in his honor. It's a little unclear. Now, he didn't, did not do it alone. He did it as part of an alliance with Moon Knight, who had a TV series recently, who was the earthly avatar of the Egyptian god Khonshu, the uh, god of travelers in the moon, uh, and also an alliance with Apocalypse, who was the guy who was hiding behind the wall uh, in uh, the, the Sphinx that we saw a little bit earlier. But the organization has persisted in some form ever since. Uh, it's had some famous members as well. Leonardo da Vinci, who you see here, was uh, was an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., that's true. Uh, and <laughs> so were Sir Isaac Newton and Michelangelo and Galileo. And so, in fact, was Benjamin Franklin, who is wearing his S.H.I.E.L.D. pin here. Uh, forgive my, you know, American bias, but this is actually pretty cool. Uh, ben Franklin actually had lots of contact with present day superheroes. Like there was the time that he hooked up with Dr. Strange's girlfriend, Clea, who was time traveling. Um, and uh, much later, his ghost moved into Deadpool's house for a while. Uh, but also when he met Captain America, who was time traveling at the time too, Ben Franklin was so impressed by his costume and shield that he suggested it to Betsy Ross as a design <laughs> reference for the American flag she was working on, which is how you get, uh, you know, 1976. It was Jack a Freemason Kirby. after all, so why not yeah, a member exactly, of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all this exactly, other exactly. societies? I mean, busy, yeah. he was a busy, busy guy, very popular with the ladies, got around. And uh, so you got Captain America running out into the S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, running out on the street saying, it isn't possible, it just isn't possible. I've been ripped off by Benjamin Franklin. Love that moment. <laughs> um, now, Captain America is famously affiliated with S.H.I.E.L.D. the organization and also famously has a S.H.I.E.L.D. whose best known iteration was given to him by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as you see here. It was made by a metallurgist named Dr. Myron McLean, who was trying to recreate the metal adamantine, not, not adamantium, not adamantium, but adamantine, which is what the golden mace of Hercules, which you see here, was made uh, out of. And an alloy that Dr. McLean created, which is now known as proto-adamantium, mysteriously combined with a sample of Wakandan vibranium, and somehow Dr. McLean got the idea to cast it in the form of a perfectly round shield. Was he secretly a member of the Brotherhood of the Shield? No one's talking. This is a conspiracy theory that you will only hear from me. But what the shield of Imhotep and all of its offspring tell us in the context of the big Marvel story is that there is a force that protects us from and defends us against monstrosities and catastrophes. And that force is science and knowledge. Mm, yeah. All the most interesting characters of the sixties comics, they're scientists. They all have all the best heroes, all the best villains. They all have PhDs. That's a big thing. 
even if the people creating the stories don't necessarily understand the science they're dropping, which happens a lot, a lot. The only really good use of science I've seen recently comes actually the unbeatable Squirrel Girl comics from the past couple of years. Really, really solid grasp of computer science. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff from that. Anyway, our fourth item is the ultimate nullifier here. Mm -hmm. This is a diagram from one of those uh, like handbooks I was talking about from the 80s where like, we're going to give you diagrams of what all these things look like. Reference. Reference for artists. Uh, the ultimate nullifier first shows up in 1966 at the climax of the original Galactus story. The Watcher basically gives it to the Fantastic Four, and this godlike being, Galactus, recoils in horror from it, saying, like, this could destroy everything. What are you thinking in the hands of a human? Although uh, Galacta, the daughter of Galactus, later points out that Galactus very kindly didn't mention that the safety was still on. Uh, then after that original story, it doesn't show up for another 16 years. This is a what-if story from 1982, where this guy named Korvac gets a hold of it, and in his passion to bring order to the universe, he uses the ultimate nullifier and all becomes nothing. This negative space here belongs to Eternity, who is within the Marvel story, the reification of the universe, if one can say that there can be a reification of the universe. This is why I love comics, y'all. Uh, about, about a decade later, the ultimate nullifier turns up again in another story with the same writer, Mark Grunewald. Quasar here tries to use it to nullify the Magus, but ends up accidentally nullifying himself. Wah, wah. Uh, then Reed Richards uses it to nullify Abraxas here and effectively destroys the universe and then rebuilds it. Funny thing, the universe has been destroyed and then rebuilt uh, at least eight times in the court of the 60 year Marvel story. Uh, we, we are currently on the eighth or ninth iteration of, of the universe. Um, it's, it's pretty much the same each time, but um, also around this time, the ultimate nullifier is briefly stolen by the Justice League of America. Long story. But then a funny thing happens. People start taking the ultimate nullifier kind of lightly. Uh, Spider-Man actually actually sets it off here uh, in, in this story and thinks, well, uh, it's not the ultimate annihilator, it just kind of changes probability. Uh, and then it starts to turn up everywhere, like it's alternate universe stories, there's one with Star-Lord here. Uh, there's a thing that the Space Punisher uses to take revenge on the Watchers and then finds out that it's a hoax, quote, one of our many tools to confuse and control. There's a different version of the Punisher who becomes bonded with the ultimate nullifier uh, back in the Marvel Universe's main timeline. Spider-Man just runs into it in a bunch of stuff that's being thrown across the room. Uh, and it turns up in a briefcase in Florida with a little Nick Fury here. And for some reason, uh, Dupe has it sitting on his desk along with a six pack uh, that has Devil Dinosaur on its packaging. I mean, at this point, you can get an ultimate nullifier for roughly the price of a you know slab copy of Wolverine number one. And in fact, my friend Brian, who hosts the amazing podcast Marvel by the Month, has an ultimate nullifier hanging on his wall in case of emergencies. And yes, that is Thor's hammer Mjolnir hanging next to it as the thing you're supposed to break the glass with. So uh, what do we know about the Marvel story from the ultimate nullifier? Well, when the nullifier first appeared, it was the product of the era of mutual assured destruction, the kind of instant annihilation that we once thought was coming for us at any time. The abrupt end of the Marvel story or the abrupt end of all stories. But the Marvel story isn't a novel. Uh, it's not a film. It is no longer even the kind of story that can end. And the thing that we once thought could destroy us without us even knowing what hit us, it is still frightening. And it's maybe even more omnipresent and banal than it ever was, but we can joke about it now. Finally, our fifth object here is also the most recently introduced one. This is a Krakoan gate. These first appeared about uh, three years ago. They are grown from seeds and they allow mutants, people who are born with a genetic mutation, to pass instantly from wherever they are to Krakoa, which you see here, which is the mutant nation that is on an island in the middle of the ocean. And uh, the Krakoan gates started appearing at the same time as mutants declared self-determination and became a major economic and political force in the world. The first time a mutant passes through one, 
they also learn the Krakoan language because this is a new society and it is building its own culture and its own language. And it's very big on like, we're just going to recreate everything ab ovo. But only mutants or people accompanied by mutants can go through one. And even then, as it notes here, they have to ask permission for non-mutants to use a gate. And notably, uh, Kate Pride here breaks her nose trying to go through it. Um, she's the only one who gets blocked, though. Even if you want very, very badly to be a mutant, like these guys here, uh, who, who are basically want to be mutants who are not, actually. Uh, if you try to pass through a Krakoan gate, you don't go anywhere other than where you started. You're just on the other side of a physical gate that's in the same place. Uh, so here's a map of where the Krakoan gates are all over the world, and they're not just in the world. Uh, there's one that goes to other world, which is the magical metaphorical territory that is associated with the British Isles. I told you this was a complicated system. And uh, there's one in the summer house where you know, Cyclops from the X-Men, his extended family live on the moon. And there's quite a few in outer space, including this one on Chandelar, the throne world of the Shi'ar Empire. The Shi'ar Empire is basically the Roman Empire, except in space and with like bird people. It's a big thing. Um, plus, there was one planted very early on Mars, which led to mutants terraforming and settling Mars and Mars becoming the capital of the solar system. Lots of stuff happening in the comics. But what the Krakoan gates mean in the context of the Marvel story is a couple things. One of those things is that there are worlds beyond the one we know, that human existence and quotidian existence is only the beginning of the story, and that the Marvel story, this commercial entertainment, offers passageways to unimaginable places in your mind for those who are willing to invest themselves in and be part of it. But the gates are also very much political instruments. And another part of their meaning is that this story, the story in these 27,000 plus comic books, is always a political story. It is always somehow about power relations, and it always reflects what those power relations are within our own world. So that's, that is the talk. Thank you so much. I am happy to answer questions that you or anybody here has about this, about the book, about what is up with all those comics. Um, I can try to answer okay. questions about the MCU. I'll start until Paul okay. comes back to, Sweet. to take people on. <coughs> um, so let's see. Two, two things I want to discuss. Number one is, mm -hmm. what are we saying about the world as we understand it? What are we saying about the nature of the universe that really defines the nature of our worldview, our relationship to it, right? Our relationship to all mm -hmm. there is. And I want to talk about the multiverse and Doctor Strange. But first, mm -hmm. I'd like to say that I was disappointed in the depiction of death and the need for death in the uh, what story was it? It was the one with Kurt Russell depicting Ego, um, the supposed father of oh, uh, Guardians Quill, of the Galaxy 2. Or whatever, yeah. Gu Guardians 2, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and his need to destroy and pretend to love everything, but then he's going to punish it and kill it because it didn't live up to his expectations or something like that. And I'm like, you know, that is like so wrong because... The ancient view of death and a lot of our religious in mission was to mitigate the fact that, yes, we die. Everything dies. What does that mean? And the ancient relationship with death, I think, is very beautiful because it holds the promise of rebirth. This is a universe that just like the neurons in our brain they get recycled, right? Every time we go to sleep, if you have good sleep, the spent neurons are recycled and then they live again and you have to do this cleanup. Otherwise you're gonna get neurological disorders and disease and die. You gotta do the cleanup. Things live, the universe herself. You talked about the universe being created eight times. The universe itself is going to be born with the big bang and probably recycled at some point to be born again stars are born, they live, they die. The fact that stars die, they have this fiery inferno, they create the heavier elements that lays the ground for us and, and all of life to, to live. It's part of the evolutionary cycle. The promise of, of rebirth is built in and that heroes die. Heroes die and they sacrifice themselves so others can live. 
death has a whole different understanding um, that we live on that relates to the multiverse. I really love the opening of the Doctor Strange world because you've got this voice telling you, oh, you thought the material world was all that there is? Oh, well, it is just one part of a multiverse and there's many more dimensions to this world than you ever know. That is a quest um, for, for all of us to understand. That is something theoretical physics is confirming that is happening. That's what the mystics have long known. That's what the shamans have told us. That's a journey we all can take and we do in our dreams and our spontaneous mystical experiences and, and those that are, we dial up on demand. Yes, there's more to this universe than the physical universe. And so I really appreciate that aspect of it. But we, we, have, we inhabit a body, we let it go, we live again. We form in, you know, that that is a very old premise and that we can navigate death that way. So I just really want to say that I think that we are working out our relationship to the cosmos through the fiction, through the stories, that art has always been a medium by which we tell these stories. We have symbols, we have iconography, there's theatrics to this, that our cultural identity can evolve in what we tell ourselves and what we learn about the universe. I appreciate that technology has a place in this and that these are tools of technology that we send out like additional eyeballs to take a view of the world that we can now through the James Webb and other space telescopes see the origin of the universe that we can really understand its whole, that this is a journey. I hope all of that, I hope the science and what we're learning is integrated in this, but that the ancient wisdom also, um, and this is a playground for it to meet and for us to explore. And then it's made so accessible. Kids get involved. Kids are getting into science. They're getting into mythology, right? It's just such a, a proving ground for cultures to mesh and, and live on and us to explore. So it's a grand cultural project for our times, yes, yes, indeed. I just wanted to say that. And let's go to questions and comments. Start with Fred. We can do that. Thank you for your tour. Thank you for being the tour guide for all of this sure. um, and making this even more accessible, holding the mirror up to ourselves. I, I, have, I have a whole rant about uh, death within the story, but let, let, let's, let's take some questions first and then I'll, I'll rant. I wanna to get to that. Yeah. Hello, hello, Fred. hello, Fred. Yeah, hi there, thanks. I've been taking notes and, um, you know, sort of scholar that I am, I'm taking notes. But <laughs> anyway, I really, I really love everything you were, you're doing, your work. Uh, you know, I want to ask you where you're going from here in your work, but that's a later, not for the moment, but it's a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. A lot of specific questions, I guess. Uh, I'm very familiar with the Amartya Kata Indian. I'm an Indian scholar, so with the with those evolution of those comics of to tell the ancient Indian epics and gods and heroes and like that. Um, and I was wondering, you know, I mean, as you, I think you touched on this is what really constitutes a hero and what constitutes, you know, uh, what that area of heroism constitutes in our minds. Um, and, you know, how it's, it's separated from racism and nationalism and, and linguistic, uh, uh superiority or priority or something like that um i guess I've, I've seen what i would consider artistic depictions of this in, in pretty dark ways um i was in i think it was ecuador and in in their really really you know disastrous national museum uh in a case anybody's been to quito to see it um, there was this enormous painting done around the late 1700s of, of this kind of comic book-like uh, bishop of the Catholic Church with, with a rather scantily clad uh, native South American Indian kind of groveling and in fear at his feet that kind of thing, which just shows the whole colonialist enterprise, yeah. basically sponsored by the church. Um, I was really shocked to see this. I have been. Um, 
And I just, I just I want, what's one of the questions I have is where does, you know, where does, how has that, how, okay. because, you know, we're pretty sophisticated after 2021, 22, 22, the changes in this, I mean, where does the, the nationalism and cultural superiority of like Superman, what, what has that evolved into yeah. today? That's one question. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that is a big, big question. Um, we are pretty evolved in 2022, but people in 1962 were pretty evolved for 1962. And people in oh. 2262 are going to look at us and go like, ooh, ooh what? what? Um, you always see the narratives of, the popular narratives of the moment reflecting what's happening in the moment. You know, there's... If you want to see a critique of colonialism, there's you can read the Black Panther movie that way, and it's an amazing one. And there's comics that do that too, but movies that that you know, uh, just that wonderful bit where he's a colonizer and Tanahazi Coates, who uh, you probably know him, has been writing Black Panther and Captain America for the past couple of years. Oh. Um, and like he just finished a five-year run of writing Black Panther comics. And oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, his take on Black Panther starts with the question of like, okay, why do we call this the most advanced society in the world when it's actually run by a hereditary monarchy? Uh, and goes into the question of what happens when the colonized become the colonizers? What happens when this fictional you know, utopian society we've created starts an imperialist expansion of its own. What does that mean? Um, and like that, that is, that's the substance of the thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, that being dealt with. Oh, that's good. But, and, and also the, the kind of changeover in visual literacy from like the, the, the you know, hard, paper comic book to the um to the more intangible media like the internet and so on how how, how has this changed the, the superhero what is it what has it done for it so here's here's an interesting thing about uh comics as a medium they are very very strongly linked to physical printed objects incredibly like they have this audience they're like yeah that's the way i like to consume them that's the way i like to read them uh, so there are comic book stores and they're thriving. My best friend runs a comic store here in Portland. And during the pandemic, like she was like, what's going to happen to us? And their sales went up. Mm -hmm. uh, more time to read. More time yeah. to read. And, and uh, there are digital comics now. Um, there are like anything that is available in print is also available for purchase digitally. Uh, there's a lot of comics publishers that are experimenting with digital native comics or infinite scrolling comics, you know, Lore Olympus, which you want to talk about something that deals with systems of mythology, Lore Olympus is a real big one, uh, is hugely, hugely popular. And there was not a print version of it until just a couple of months ago. Um, it's done by a woman in New Zealand. And it's, it's just like, taken on and modernizing greek mythology and it is digital native it is meant to be read on the screen it is meant to be read actually on a phone because you just keep scrolling up and it is a long vertical like that's what it's visually designed for uh, so yeah stuff always like stories the f stories are determined by their form um when superhero comics were exclusively 17 to 25 page pamphlets. That was the length of the unit of story you got. Now you, for the last 20 years or so, the economic model has been like, you serialize it in 20 page pamphlets, and then you collect it into a square bound book. Uh, somebody was asking earlier about the distinction between comic books and graphic novels. They are literally the same thing. A graphic novel is a term of art. It just means a comic book with a square spine. <laughs> square bound instead of instead of saddle, saddle stitched um, so, so on your phone you would just have a comic strip running this way instead yeah. of this way exactly yeah. Same uh, or instead of something with pages that you turn yeah uh, but like that's 
people within the comics world, when they say graphic novel, they don't mean something with particular kinds of artistic aspirations. They mean something with a square spine. Mm -hmm. And usually thicker and bigger. Yeah, yeah. longer. Yeah. yeah. Um, comic. Uh, I was oh, also wondering about like artistic representation where we have really detailed art early on and then there's very sort of simple representative forms now um all kind of more stylized as far as i can see but i mean maybe not you, you look like you may disagree yeah, um, i mean what mainstream comics especially superhero comics look like has changed radically over time uh and <clears throat> two three of the big technological changes there Number one, uh, since the late 80s, there has been a demand for much more detailed rendering. Um, and that's, that's not universally the case. There are people who use simpler or more reductive or more like, let's just get three lines to do all the work styles. Uh, <clears throat> but the dominant style now is very often one that is very, very fussy rendering. Uh, which is why in the 60s, you could have Kirby drawing like four or five comics a month. And now there's very, very few artists who can do 12 issues of a book a year because just the, the kind of rendering that's demanded. Um, the second big change is coloring. Because coloring used to be a thing like you had CMYK, CMYK screens and they could be printed 25%, 50% or 100%. And you got 64 different colors you could use out of that. And now since the mid nineties, like you've got digital coloring technology and you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hues to the point where most colorists will pick a specific palette that they will use on a particular project and mostly stick to those colors to give it a distinctive look and feel. Uh, and the third one is printing. We've gone from being printed on like cheap, cheap newsprint, basically toilet paper to like solid, like glossy stock that can do like really, really nice uh, representations of things, like reproductions of things. And so the kind of visual representation of the physical world that you see has changed a lot. Like, like I say, you can look at, you can look at a given panel and see when it was drawn because different times demand different kinds of styles but the effectively the overton window for visual style in mainstream comics is now wide enough that you can see <clears throat> things that look radically radically different from each other and still kind of hold them in your head as belonging to the same fictional fictional space Mm, cool. Are some of them really um, valuable, like Disney sells some of their original cartoon um, cells, you know, the right. drawings can be really valuable. Are some of these from the favorite artists' renditions, are they similar? I know it's not a okay. film yeah. process. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, original comics art, uh, like particularly notable pages by particularly notable artists, it's millions of dollars. Um, really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. wow. I, I want to go back to Black Panther. I, I was kind of shocked when their advanced civilization was all about technology mm -hmm. and kind of Western technology. And I'm like, really? Let's redefine what advanced can be. I thought, you know, Africa's our birthplace. Africa is where we all square one for, the, for Homo sapiens sapiens and advanced there are different ways of being advanced than just Western technology. So I was kind of disappointed that we couldn't have a broader definition of advanced. Well, um, a couple points to that. First of all, like if you're going to invent advanced technology, you have to invent technology, like conceiving of what something looks like, you're only going to be able to work with what you already know. Uh, but also very notably when, when Black Panther was created in 1966, it was a political statement. Like you have the first okay. black superhero in American comics, um, first African superhero in American comics, and Wakanda is introduced and the, the, the sequence where it's introduced turns all of the accepted at the time cliches on their head. It is, you know, deepest, darkest Plata. Africa. What is it going to be? We are the most techno technologically advanced country in the world. That's new. Yeah, yep. that's and, and, really fresh. Yeah, and I have to say that coming up when Thomas Wynn will talk with us about some of the hand tools and the axes, 
We see them as, oh, maybe a napstone, but he's gonna tell us how sophisticated our earliest tools were and how versatile and how much thought and physics goes into the creation of our first tools. So I appreciate that, that it's just born within us to, you know, the inklings of all that we've done are, are right there in our first incarnations, so. Any other comments, Fred? Oh gosh, I have so many comments and questions, yeah. but uh, just, just FYI, uh, Doug, I, I gave a paper at this really yeah. stuffy academic conference about like 2016. It was not received with the kinds of response that I was hoping, but I, it was a paper, I'm, I'm deep in translating parts of the ancient Indian epic, the Mahabharata national epic. And I've always kind of envisioned people sitting around fires, telling yeah. stories late at night to each other, to the children. And I, I kind of used yeah. as my research material, not just my Sanskrit originals, but material, you know, you know, uh, Grant Morrison and so on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, mentioned Grant person. Morrison, and like one person in the, in the audience had heard of him. And, yeah. uh, but I was really kind of envisioning the whole ancient epic as a, as a, as a dazzling kind of comic. There's so much in there that, yeah. that, that you can see on, on like somebody shooting hundreds of arrows at the same time, piercing the tips of the enemy arrows as they fly towards them mm -hmm. and so on. And, uh, um, but I, I've, I've been looking at, at this and at Grant Morrison and others for quite a long time now as kind of paradigms for the, uh, or the ancient epics as paradigms for the, you know, more contemporary um, epics that, 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 you're, that you're referring to. I just wanted to mention that. But what I wanted to ask you also is when you read a new, a new comic, I mean, with your degree of sophistication and history of and scholarship and all of that, what do you look for? Um, honestly, the first thing I look for is entertainment. And cool. I will, as somebody who's, you know, read a bunch of these and made a bunch of comics, uh, like oh. I can, I will actually, uh, this was a, uh, mini series I wrote a few years ago. It's basically about how much I hate LA. Um, what's it called? Uh, it is Judge Dredd Mega City 2. So dread, uh, so, dread, dread, dear, dear, dear. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 this is an American spinoff of a long-running British comic that I'm kind of obsessed with. Mm -hmm. um, about essentially, the, the protagonist is essentially a fascist cop. Um, it's an interesting thing. To, road to tread, um, but yes, yeah, so I, I. The stories, the stories are originally British. They are conventionally set in a horrific New York of 122 years in the future. I was like, let's look at LA. <laughs> so right there. Yeah. So it was sitting right there. Yeah. Um, but so when I read read new comics, like I can I can see the construction. I can see the thought behind them. I can see what's going into them. But I also like, let's have a story. Let's be entertained. I like that. Cool. Are there any stories in which we build out utopia on Earth, in which we solve climate change, we solve world hunger, we take the resources we have, we make the most of them, like a la Bucky Fuller, we, we distribute them justly, we create the world we want to live in? Where are those stories? Oh, sure. Um, okay. There are a bunch of those. They are generally dystopias disguised as utopias the first person to the first character to kind of like remake the world into a utopia in marvel's comics was dr doom uh who took over the planet in you know a mid 80s comic called emperor doom you know the first thing he did was you know abolish apartheid in south africa and he's uh, um and eventually decides that he's had it with uh, running the world because too much paperwork um there is a comic from the uh, mid '80s called Squadron Supreme that was by uh, Mark Grunewald and Paul Ryan. And uh, the Squadron Supreme in Marvel's comics are an alternate world's heroes. Uh, they are basically a very, very thinly veiled version of the Justice League, um, and they're like, okay. 
we have had it with human mismanagement of the world. We are now taking over. And they overthrow all the governments of the world and they set up their, and of course, like everything goes horribly wrong. Um, there was an, there's actually a, a non-Marvel thing, a thing Wildstorm published called The, the Authority, which um, went down a very, very similar path. Like, okay, uh, we are, your governments are done. Miracle Man, which is an Alan Moore project, uh, has a sequence called The Golden Age that begins with Miracle Man and his Miracle Man family, like taking over the world and abolishing money and restructuring civilization. And um, it continues into the Silver Age and then the Bronze Age and the Dark Ages. Yeah, as, just as like as out of the things, betas. Things yeah. go progressively to hell. Uh, because like the, the utopia that's just a utopia is kind of a boring story. <laughs> the utopia that's like, mm, that's not so utopia. The, interestingly, there is a period of Marvel's comics from about 2005 to 2015, where most of the villains are utopians of one kind or another. People who genuinely want to remake the world and remake culture and make everything better. And they are the villains of the piece. Uh, that gotcha. sequence- can Where the ends justify the means and we don't like their means. Yeah. yeah. Um, or maybe we don't even like their ends mm -hmm. you know i'm just looking for the stories where i mean it would be interesting fred to compare the golden age of old and what of its tenants what was it struck how does it and what we envision as a golden age right where are we going can we get there and would it be authority from the top down or is it the grassroots suddenly waking up and saying we have the power to create the world we want let's get together Let's make livingry, not weaponry. Let's let's really understand what it's going to take to pull together, right? Everybody or nobody on Spaceship Earth. Like, where is that story? <laughs> because it seems to me that's our choice for the future, and we better start building it out. We better start imagining it. Let's, and that would be a fascinating story, right? Where's the hero? Where's the collective hero journey, where we mm -hmm. can all agree on a world we want to live in and try to get there? Yeah, we're at that, that moment kind of where we better start figuring that one out. Right. That kind of leads me to another question I had. I, I was, I, I wrote this something about 15 years ago, and it that um, that took me into the world of manga, and especially to the there's a nine volume series by uh, Ozuka, I think, that Tazuma Ozuka, on the life of the Buddha, and um, which I thought it didn't have a whole lot to do with the Buddha. But it was amazing. And, um, you know, the Buddha was in there somewhere at the base of the hedgerow, maybe, as they would say in Zen. But it was uh, um, a lot there. And I just wonder if there's been any kind of trade off or mutual influences between Marvel and manga. And, and where do you see that? Oh, sure. I mean, that, that Tezuka series is amazing. Uh, the current editor-in-chief of Marvel is a guy named C.B. Cebulski, who oh. uh, has spent a lot of time working in, like, working in Asia and working with especially Japanese artists, um, mm -hmm. and actually got in some trouble a few years ago when it turned out that he had been writing for Marvel under the name Akira Yoshida. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but... Uh, in there, there is certainly an influence from that kind of storytelling that really starts in the '80s with like Frank Miller, who had been reading, you know, Lone Wolf and Cub and uh, Kazuo Koike stuff, uh, and bringing in that kind of that approach to visual storytelling in particular. Uh, there's also been like. You know, believe there have been some like manga versions of Marvel's characters. There was like there was a long running like Spider-Man Japan series. Like like yeah. um, so uh there there's some cross pollination there. There are very different approaches to storytelling in a lot of ways and the cross pollination is small and ongoing, not major, but it's there. There. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I was wondering how would they I mean is there idea of a superhero different from yours or America's or whatever. well I mean I don't I don't know that 
there even is a coherent idea of a superhero like there's lots there's lots of narrative conventions around it mm-hmm. but uh Grant Morrison, who you mentioned, has an amazing line in their book, Super Gods, to the effect that, you know, maybe superheroes aren't a genre, maybe it's just an ingredient you can add to any other kind of story to make it more interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I I really like the idea. (laughs) What story's missing, in your opinion? What what haven't they touched on that would be, uh, really should be there? Or has it all been said and written about, other than a real utopia? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I perpetually get surprised. Um, certainly if there's, if there's an aching need for a particular kind of story, then that story will be told. The one kind of story that is very, very hard to tell in this kind of context is a story that brings closure to the whole thing. Gotcha. We don't want that. Story can, <laughs> we want the story it to can, keep going. And there have been ways in which that's been done. Um, Jonathan Hickman, who's brilliant, did a long, long sequence in, from 2012 to 2015 that ended with basically, here is the end of the story. Like this, this is this 60 year story. This is a place where like it is narratively resolved. Yeah. Um, and then of course it goes on from there because it can't end, it can't ever end. But the never actual, ending story, but, but actual like narrative resolution, that's real rare. Real rare mm-hmm. because for the same reason that in fact here's my rant goes death. Okay, and, I hear that. Boy. And character death in the context of this big story. It's hugely dramatically effective, or rather it used to be. Because in an ongoing story like this, in an ongoing commercial concern like this, mm-hmm. if there is a character who matters enough that their death is going to have a dramatic impact, they matter enough that somebody's going to want to use them again at some point. Then they get so, revived. Yeah. And they get, so come back from the dead. There used to be like the, the, like the standard joke line in the comics world was like, everybody who dies comes back eventually, except uh, Bucky Barnes and Uncle Ben. And then Bucky Barnes came back. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. All yeah, right. Winter Soldier. Um, so it, it became like, and if you remember the early 90s, like, oh, no, the death of Superman. Oh, no, Superman is gone. We'll never see him again. Tears, tears from eyes. Mm-hmm. He's back in you know, nine months, whatever. Yeah. The death of Captain America, 2006, 2007, whenever that, that was, was like, that was like, OK, we're going to make some headlines here. And everyone's like, you know, he'll, he'll be he'll be back. Mm-hmm. He will be back. And it became sort of a commonplace like, OK, yeah, they'll be they'll be back. So what's interesting that's happening now is a third wave in reaction to that, which is leaning into that as part of the story. Uh, There was just a series called The Immortal Hulk, which ran for about four years. It's great. The premise is like, oh yeah, Bruce Banner really wants to die and he can't. Mm. He just keeps coming back to life whenever you kill him. And it's, you know, it's a horror story. It's a body horror story. Uh, it is a, like, it is a, the story of Job's story, like the endless suffering story. Um, and X-Men for the last couple of years, like the, the same time as the, like, we're becoming a global superpower thing. Part of that is like, oh, and we have figured out how to fix death. Mm-hmm. Whenever one of us dies, we can come back from the dead. Like, so this thing that has become a big narrative problem, which is that like, all these characters die and then they're back six months later. So we can't really it lose it at all. Like drama. Yeah. Uh, the drama becomes like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, but if you can come back from the dead whenever you want to, ooh, what does that open up? Yeah. If you call all the zombies, it's like the, put that machine in the mm-hmm. glass case, right? It's, it's on the desk with the pizza. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. So thank you. Thanks, Fred. Yeah. All good points. Good comments, obviously. And Fred, we could do a whole thing with Fred. And we will. <laughs> and we, we will. will. Uh, yeah. I was going to also mention that Todd Van Poole uh, is a collector of comic books. So ah. being a professor of anthropology, ah. 
possibly the anthropology and its impact yes. on comic books on civilization. Yes. There's a paper to be written here. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> hey, Todd, I'm going to bring you on, on board here. Dr. Just have some questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I sure appreciate all that you said, and it, it's a, a lot of fun. Um, there's been a lot of interesting research from an anthropological perspective on uh, comparing, comparing traditional myths to uh, the superhero myths but also in terms of, for example, uh, network analysis. In real life, when you deal with uh, traditional cultures, uh, one person may or may not know other people around them, and you can actually map out how many contacts people have and how likely they are to interact with each other based upon kinship and whatnot. Some anthropologists have done some interesting research looking at superhero teams. And if, for example, you're a member of the Avengers, what does that mean in terms of your interaction with uh, Spider-Man? these sorts of of uh, studies and it's it's very interesting and I, I sure appreciate your work it's it's worthwhile i have to admit that i really love the 80s and the 90s stuff more than i love the the stuff today so you and i might like slightly different titles but it's all good and i sure do enjoy the comics as well I uh, he owns a few comic books so our ongoing joke is if anything unfortunate happens to him i will bait a human saying went out with a large comic book collection looking for a, a date or one like that's been ongoing joke because he has so many comics they'll come out of the woodwork i'm sure <laughs> okay you have two sons how did you and oh, the they son... said they will not um i will not be able to use that as bait anymore they've already done the, the already comic book the collection collections in fact i asked when you were talking i said so when did you get your first comic book he's like I was about eight. It was an Aquaman. Aquaman, 1976. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so I was just like, yeah. So, but here's my crazy thought today was as you were talking about the art and how busy it is and how they're moving forward. And it's really when Stan Lee and the artist, I'm sorry, I'm blinking on the name, did um, the art yeah, and then Kirby. Stan Lee just put in mm -hmm. a little bit of the text. I kept thinking about classic Maya um, art. And so we have wonderful vases where the artwork of the Maya kings and nobilities and scribes are just absolutely gorgeous. That's 99% of the information is being given graphically with a little bit of the writing text of the syllabary. And I was like, wow, there's another comparison between modern day comics and ancient Maya. It's the same principle is that work. So I thought that was cool. That was my unusual thought for the day. <laughs> Neat. Does uh, this and get any of the courses that you teach the anthropology of um, you know heroes today or uh, we need to add it. <laughs> I actually use comic book uh, images throughout my uh, uh, courses, and so uh, where I'm talking about hunting Pleistocene animals and how uh, dangerous they were, I actually have a picture of Spider-Man versus the versus the rhino um, <laughs> as part of that, talking about how dangerous and it. They're, they're fun. You were going to say something, though, sir. Go ahead, please. Oh, oh, uh, to that, uh, I once gave a five-minute talk about Kant's critique of aesthetic judgment that was entirely illustrated with pictures of Wolverine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so Logan, go. <laughs> two, two points to what you were saying earlier. One is, in terms of the social networks, I realized... Uh, when I was writing a little bit about Spider-Man, that like, so Spider-Man is the guy who has met everybody, mm -hmm. except there was one major character who had their own comic for over 200 issues that Spider-Man has never met on panel. Can you guess who it is? I was gonna say Punisher, but he actually had a crossover with Punisher. He first a appeared in, uh, Punisher first appeared in the Spider-Man story. That's right, so I, I give up, I'm not sure. Millie the model. <laughs> Fair enough. And Mary Jane Watson has worked with Millie the model. So uh interesting. I'm, so I'm curious in the 80s, like what were the what were the titles that you really liked? What were the so I, I really loved um Spider-Man, of course, the, the three titles of Spider-Man. Um <laughs> I uh loved uh the X-Men. Um Captain America was probably my favorite, and of course the Avengers going from that, and then Iron Man and uh uh Ghost Rider okay. and um uh, Doctor Strange were probably the ones I collected the most. Nice. He has all the original Doctor Strange. So as you were talking about, I said we need to, I need to filter through his archives and look at him after we come back from New Mexico. <laughs> there is yeah. a particular Steve Ditko Doctor Strange panel that I am probably going to get as a tattoo at some point. So <laughs> cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh it's an interesting the nostalgia that we have for for these comic books so mm -hmm. two points when my 
uh, we'd go visit my dad after dinner. We would put our iPad up on the dinner table and we go, okay, dad, where do you want to go? One of the things that he wanted to look at besides the automat where he had lunch as a young man, when he worked for NBC as a page, we had to go see that the apartment building where he grew up in Brooklyn and the comic books that he read as a child. And I said, mm -hmm. they'll be on. No, no, they won't. Yes, we, and so we found, and he told us about all that he read uh, as a kid. It was just lovely to get to know him in these ways. And so, the other well, one visuals, of, yeah. One of my favorite possessions still to this day is the uh, Teen Titan X-Men 1982 crossover, which oh, is a, yeah. one of my, I, perhaps the my single favorite um, comic Claire, book. It's, Claremont oh, it's, Simonton, that's amazing. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. This yeah. is great. This is another whole <laughs> aspect of pod we haven't met before. So oh, yes. Is, yeah. We see we see what makes him excited. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you that go, there's a guy who's read most, if not every single Marvel. I'm not sure, but you need to go today, Todd. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed, sir. That's, that's dedication. I do not have. Well, there is something. I, I know Lewis Schlein. I remember an interview with him where he was saying that Leonard writing, Schlein. Leonard Schlein, Leonard, Leonard Schlein, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the alphabet, alphabet and the, the goddess. goddess. Yeah. So he was saying that he believed that we actually changed as a civilization our neurological underpinnings Perfect. when we went from pictures mm -hmm. to tell stories and verbal. We right. had images and verbal. And then we went to writing where we right. used just one hand. And so mm -hmm. that did us a disservice for some time in terms of the working of our brain and the well, dominance mm -hmm. of the right brain, he's theorized. And he thought it was a very good thing that we went back to an image-based society and typing where we use both hands yeah. because that integrated the hemispheres of the brain mm -hmm. and that images are now just as important to us as words and that reintegrates us. And that's what our early uh, cultures had, imagery and, and verbal storytelling. We never stopped. We never stopped using imagery. And we never stopped using verbal storytelling. Yeah, um, but just how we uh, the enduring power of imagery. Christine and I have had long talks about how imagery and symbology and iconography. We can still decode that. We can still understand our earlier cultures, our ancestors, our lineage through the images that they that they create yeah. and the images that we can also see. Um, in a wider bandwidth yeah. way yeah so here's here's the thing that i don't know and i'm curious about um when you look at image-based systems of writing of communication can you tell who made the image is there you know is there stylistic variation in the way that absolutely those okay yeah and there's people like take for example there's a pottery type from new mexico called members black and white bowls and they're about 80 1000 there are people that identified six to seven major artists that have done the bulk of those bowls so absolutely and this uh, there are great tiles like painted by a single hand and i say something called casas grandes iconography from about 80 1250 to 1450 and there are a number of jars that I'm pretty sure are made by the same person and the, and the same person painted. It's not clear if the same person sculpted them and then painted, or if you have one person sculpting and another per person painting. So you could have a man wife team or a, a woman woman team or something like that. But yeah, there are things that I'm pretty sure it's the same person with their same stylized, the way they paint things and put them on the pottery. It's the same hand doing that. They're even tracing that back to the Paleolithic artists as oh, well. Absolutely, and I, I individuals. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. With today's tech, uh, it's yeah. amazing. Thank you. Any last words, Todd, on the anthropology of comic books? No. <laughs> Fun topic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Like Husband, Chris, wife, anthropology team. Yeah. yeah. Christine and Todd. Thank you both. Yeah. So. At University of uh, Missouri, right? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Hands up. I don't see anybody's hands up on it. Using I appreciate hands. Dory saying that it was the Marvel and the other superhero films that got her through COVID. Right. In inspiring. Yeah. 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 She did that. Thank and then you. she also said, you know, the discussion of archetypes, uh, well, the Marvel mm, characters, the archetypes, themes yeah. that go through the world cultures, the heroes, the villains, the male, the female, the witch, the virgin, the wise woman, you know, the, the whole yeah. thing. So, yeah. 
Again, I think it's part of the awakening for women to take our rightful place back side by side as co-equals to the male species. Right. Um, that the that these female superheroes, the heroines, are are depicting, are paving the way uh, culturally. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. 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 So, I was going to yeah. ask you also, uh, Douglas, yeah. when you turn on the well, you you're the type of person that would not turn on the evening news. You'd go read the news in the New York Times or whatever. But when you look at the world news that's happening, do you see it through the eyes of the mythology of what you've, you've experienced, uh, what you've read from the, uh, uh, the comics? Or is it kind of like the other way around? It's like, the, I don't know, how, how, do, how, do you, how do you see the current world situation? And do you see parallels in understandings and, and resolution in ways for you to navigate the world without feeling kind of crazy at some of the things that are going on that you can put them in perspective? That is a big and deep and interesting question. Uh, I don't know that I have a good answer to it. Like it, it obviously, like it informs the way I think in some ways, uh, yeah. and it informs it both ways. Like the world in, inspires how I read the comics, the comics inspire how I see the world, but can't I can't think of a good and concrete example. I'm sorry. Uh, if one if one comes to me, I will. I'll be the one who stumped you. I'll take full credit for anyone who stumped Douglas. <laughs> and <laughs> someone had someone had their their hand up. It was a, okay, or, good. Let's yeah. go to that. Yes. Oh, oh okay, Rob. Oh, there you are. oh yes. Hi. I see that. Hey. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted. I have two basic questions. One is, how did uh, back in the? I remember when I was a kid. There was a, a bunch of parents who were opposed to comics and said things like it would rot your brain and they didn't want people to read comic books. It's back in, I guess, the early 60s. As a result, I think the uh, parental code came out for uh, comic books. There was a code that came out uh, that told what I don't think they could show like people getting killed and things like this. I kind of stopped reading comics in the uh, early 70s and started reading underground comics and then later heavy metal magazine and the heroes are completely different in that mm -hmm. i was wondering though uh if you've compared like uh in levy strauss's uh Ron cook he has the uh, these 12 characteristics of a hero and he compares it to classic heroes like arthur and jesus or and gilgamesh there's certain uh characteristics that they'll you know they don't have all the characteristics, but they're common characteristics. Yeah. And if those fall in line with the uh, superheroes that we have today. So the question is about, uh, you know, Levi Strauss's characteristics of the heroes and things. Um, what he was doing and what you also saw, you know, like Joseph Campbell doing was descriptive rather than prescriptive. Uh, it was like, here here's here's the things that we see these are things that these that these myths have in common uh, rather than a description of what makes a hero like i said i don't know if there's even a consensus now on what heroism even necessarily is uh, and i think a lot of interesting stories get come out of that particular friction um that discomfort with the idea of is there somebody who represents what is best in all ideologies and no there's kind of not and they're going to com come in conflict with each other which is why a lot of the most interesting like, superhero comic stories of the last you know, 20 25 years are about factions of protagonists in conflict with each other different means different ends so that's that is my equivocal response to that and i think i saw another hand um, thank you ron thank good, you. Good thanks ron yeah yeah good, yeah. To, see you. Yeah. good to see you all again yeah yeah uh, david hicks is ready to ask a question david hi no we're a little short on time here uh so i started reading uh comics back in junior high in the mid early 70s mid 70s and the two that caught my interest were conan the barbarian and thor and i happened to catch thor comics when it was a series where he was dealing with other gods and outer space characters and then i discovered because i didn't know the storyline 
that he was some guy in what was it, New York or something, you know, and and I quickly lost interest because I had no interest in the modern stuff and ended up focusing on Conan, who, you know, was a different time, different era, uh, combating evil wizards. And um, and I watch, you know, and I see the movies today where they have these superheroes in, in the current date and I read media where there just seems to be this desperation that kids have some sort of a, a hero to look look to. And I just I I just wonder if um it creates unrealistic expectations among kids mm. when they have the you know who's gonna rescue us? You know, instead of can we rescue ourselves? Who's going to be outside of us that's going to rescue us? And do you do you see that as Good point yeah. as a, a I don't know a controversial pattern? I don't know what to no. I don't know where I'm going with it, but no, that's a good question, David. Uh, I suspect that the parents of the kids who were around when the uh, first myths were being uh, created in oral tradition had pretty much the same concerns. <laughs> <laughs> are they serving as inspiration or excuse yeah. to yeah. Right, right exactly yeah that's an interesting response yeah yeah anything else david, david? Yeah. yeah thank you david i do yeah. want to say that ron brought up gilgamesh and we've had sister margaret O'Rourke, a catholic nun part of our community really talk a bit about in earlier um, times about the power of the cultural myths to overthrow the female um, status, right? Yeah. To overthrow the female gods, goddesses. And uh, I, she was saying that she spent time with a group where they really were analyzing how this was done. And um, I want to say that they're powerful, these myths. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows them. They have hidden messages. They tell us something about the world as we think it, as we view it this changes, this evolves. Maybe it's time for a new story for humanity. There's, there's many, been many speakers in this forum to talk about that. We need a new cosmology. We are redefining our relationship with ourselves, with one another, with our earth, with the cosmos. These, this is powerful stuff. And I just wanna say that as this goes forth, I, I hope that we have mythologies that also serve us to make, to make our way forward in a world that we want to live in, dealing with what we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But this is a powerful medium, an important medium. These stories that we tell ourselves, we're all a piece of this. We all have a voice in this. This is one of the joys of the democratic um, medium that we have today to have conversations like this and with one another. Um, so I think this is so vital to, to examine who we are, where we've been, where we're going. And um, so let's let the conversation continue. Let us move the dial through dialogue. Yeah. And we appreciate the work that you've done today, the time you spent with us today, Douglas, and you, Douglas. the guide that you've been uh, to, yeah. to the stories. But let's look and examine who we are, where yeah. we're going. Let's take it into account and start to shape it where we want to go collectively. Yeah. And we appreciate the anthropologists, the scholars among us, who help uh, do this. We appreciate all of our voices. We, we appreciate the questions that we're asking. It's a vital times to do this, mm -hmm. to rethink, to reclaim, to reassess. So yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me, Laura and Paul. This has been a pleasure. Yeah. Paul, thank you. You're, you're thank e you. easy interview and we really appreciate that perspective. I think that definitely, I don't know, I'll speak for anyone else, but what a tremendous uh, mind-blowing and opening perspective for me because it's not an area that I've been a part of and so to have you introduce it to us and then because of the fact that we're interviewing you of course we had to do a little bit of homework and then we really started <laughs> stepping into that Marvel universe and yeah. see what the Marvel universe had to share with us and so hopefully it will be something oh like I was an early follower of Thor well you me. more than me yeah in Doctor Strange yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, so great. Well, thank anyway, you so much. And name final last Susan. words, final comment, Douglas. Oh yeah, it's going to hold up your book. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will hold up a copy of it with the dust jacket. Even so, here you go. Oh yes, good. 
Yep. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. You could tell Rain was a was a serious reader. He took off the dust jacket. Yeah. Cool. yeah. We also have one last tradition, and that is we ask everybody to turn on turn on their mics. I unmuted everybody so they can say goodbye to you themselves and say thank you themselves. So everybody, please feel free to speak up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. 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 Right. Okay. Good bye health bye. and blessings to you Thank all. You. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Sunday.